As we're conducting this interview today from uh, Earl Middleton's residence at 8535 Bindley Mounds Road in Blanchester, Ohio. His telephone number is area code 513-877-2697. Uncle Bud. Can you give us your name and... My name is Earl Middleton. And your date of birth, please. Place and date of February birth. February 1st, 1919. St. Charles, Michigan. Your branch of service and... Pardon? Your branch of service. I was drafted into the ordinance. And, well, it was... It was a quartermaster, but it changed the ordinance in about a month. I was... Uh, left Saginaw to go to Detroit for my examination and uh, we went on a bus. Seems everybody had a bottle of whiskey but me. Every time the bus would put on its brakes the empty bottles would roll forward. When they would start up they would roll to the back of the bus. <laughs> and after getting my physical air we were shipped to uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. This was, uh, you were in the Army? Yes. Well, what I was already sworn in. What about your, uh, uh, your military number? Do you uh, recall your serial number? 361-506-73. Serial number. What was the highest rank that you had uh, attained in the service? T4. And you were talking about your induction then? That sounded like you had a pretty good time on on the way to the induction center. Well, I didn't drink whiskey. But those guys forgot everything. I don't know how they passed. It's curious. And then uh, went to uh, Fort Warren, Wyoming. It was supposed to be for 14 weeks training. And the war was going on. They uh, shipped us out in uh, seven weeks, four weeks of uh, military training, four weeks automotive school. But going out on the train, we ate, uh, they cooked on a car, the middle car, and half the battalion or half the people would go through, come back in and get pick up their food and their mess kit. And then they'd reverse it. Uh, the other half would walk through. And then on their way back to their seats, they would uh, pick up their food and their mess kits. And then when they were finished eating, that's when we had to go through it again, repeat it. And uh, uh, wash our mess kits. And after uh, the seven weeks, I was sent to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey where we were supposed to go uh, overseas. Camp, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Baltimore, Baltimore Ordnance Depot. Welcome, bud. Before we go any further with that, could, could you tell us a little something about uh, being drafted and uh, the draft boards and deferments and that sort that of went on before uh, you actually got in the service? No. There were no deferments or? I had a deferment. You had a deferment. And what was the basis of deferments back uh, back then? We lived on a farm and I got to stay yeah. home. Yeah. But during that time, war broke out. War broke out December the 7th and I had my deferment before that. And uh, after uh, Baltimore and Steffel, we were going to go overseas from Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. And we stayed there about seven or eight weeks, never did go. I would get letters from home. They would go overseas. I even had an APO number. I would write home and get home in a couple of days. When they'd answer, it would take about two or three weeks. Hmm. And uh, then they sent us back to Baltimore again. Well, before we get too far into that, could you give us uh, some idea about your basic training, where you went for basic training? And Fort Warden, Wyoming. And uh, you were trans your induction center, I believe you said, was uh, in, in Michigan somewhere? Yes. You were inducted where? Uh, 
Camp Custer. Camp Custer. I think it's a day in Arbor. Okay. Then uh, how long did you sp spend in the induction center? About two or three days. Is that quick? Well, here's something that's kind of silly. I mean, they over the PA, they wanted volunteers. Nobody volunteered. They all took off. They were smarter than me. So I was one of the few left. And they called us to the kitchen and put us on gay fee. So I had a, my job was dusting donuts <laughs> all night long for troops that are coming into the induction center. And then we lo got loaded on the train. We left at night, went to uh, Fort Warren, Wyoming. What did you do uh, for clothing? Were you still in your civilian clothes? No, you we had clothes, and they just give you ones that look close. Some were too big, some were too small. You had to get them tailored after you got where you were going. Mine fit fairly good. Did was the issue that you received was it the uh, work clothes and dress clothes, or just yeah, it was everything. It was everything. Yeah, yep. just shove it all in a duffel bag. Shove it all in a duffel bag. Two pairs of shoes or one? You know, I can't remember about the shoes. Mark, we just issued boots. Then after Baltimore. Well, let's see. We were, we were going to go to basic training. You, you were heading out west to basic? Yeah. Can you give us Fort any? Warren, Wyoming. Fort Warren, Wyoming. Can you give us uh, any insights what happened out there, your transportation? No. Said? I got one pass in seven weeks to go into Cheyenne. Out there with the Cowboys. Yeah. How long was the basic training? Really, it was only four weeks. The other four was school, automotive school. I mean, it wasn't held in conjunction? They were uh, subsequent? No, you they were all on the same base. But, I mean, you, you had your basic training first and then the No, automotive? basic training first. Okay. okay. And then uh, four weeks of that, then uh, the automotive school. Now, they had every kind of a school there. They had Baker's school and... Everything that you could think of. But after you got with your unit, the guys that were our cooks was never a, uh, went to school. The only given them was a hatchet and open the cans. <laughs> what about your transportation from Michigan out to Wyoming? That was by train or by, by bus? Train. Okay. By train. Any, anything significant about the train ride? or? Were you traveling with uh, other civilians? or No, was no, no. Train? It was strictly uh, military. military train. And uh, I guess we had to get in and sneak in between the other trains on the line. Sometimes the train would be going, oh, really, to beat the devil. And other times, I mean, they'd pull over on the side and wait for maybe a half hour for another train to pass. What about your facilities out there for basic training? Were you in regular barracks? Or yes, regular barracks. It clap, was good. The, the clapboard or? Uh, yes. Uh, we even had uh, one sheet every two weeks out there. And the one sheet you would fold it so you had a top and a bottom. You got a fresh sheet every two yeah, weeks. Yeah, huh? out there. The only one I ever had. Let's see. Uh, this would be... Spring, you were out there, but going uh, out west, you early, were early. Well, from May, we left there probably in July. So, okay, you were out there in July, so yeah. So the weather, what was the what was the weather? Miserable? The weather was nice out there. What was uh, you went in as a private? Do you recall what the pay scale was? I think it was eighteen dollars a month. Maybe 21, I don't know. But soon after that, we got a raise. I was getting $30 a month, I think. That was, okay. We had to, we lined up for pay. The ones with the most rank got through first. We got through last. Could, could you go through the enlistment, enlisted men's uh, rank because I know you had like staff sergeants and that and they don't have those now. You were privates and private first yeah, class and, and D5. Then corporals. 
Yeah. They have corporal, then, then a sergeant. Yeah. Then uh, what? That was it. A master sergeant? Well, I didn't get that on. No, but I mean... Uh, I went to like, staff sergeant, tech sergeant, master sergeant. Okay. And then from there it was warrant officer. Right. There wasn't a officer and there wasn't an enlisted man. I don't know what you'd call them. Anything stick out in your memory about some of the clowns in basic training or uh, anything uh, humorous happened while you were in basic? No. No, that was fun. What type of automobiles uh, did you use in the service and what years were they and what models were cars? they? Cars? Yes, cars and trucks. Well, the trucks that we worked on, had our training on, was the old 3C cam trucks. They were probably in the early 30s, maybe mid-30s, that we worked on. And what models would they, would they be Dodge or Ford? Chevrolet or? is ones Chevrolet. I worked on. Okay. But there, there was no cab, you just chassis, motor and chassis. They have GI parties then for cleaning up the barracks and what have you for your basic training? Oh, uh, yeah. Memorable? Yeah. <laughs> uh, basically, cleaning up wasn't bad, but we had to take our tailors on guard. And the night before I went on guard duty, they had a break out of prison. It was, it was just a wooden... What kind of barracks? Prison? The military prison or what? Yeah, people were AWOL, just minor things, but they had uh, wire, woven wire fence over the windows. And somebody had got a hold of flyers, and they cut their way out, and they had an escape. And that there was kind of big for me at the time. So you were on guard duty. What kind of weapon did they issue you? We had uh, uh, an old Springfield rifle, bolt action. They gave us one <laughs> round of ammunition. <laughs> Barney Fife. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Okay, so you finished up there in Wyoming in, in eight weeks with your basic training and, and your mechanical training. Then where did you go? You went to well, I, Baltimore. You went to Baltimore for your advanced training. To go overseas. Oh, you we were supposed to go overseas from there. They gave us all new clothes. <clears throat> uh, so what were you issued in Baltimore then? Well, let's see. Let's back up. You went from Wyoming to uh, Baltimore, Baltimore by train. Yeah. As a what sort of company? It's a company, a regiment, battalion. They, I. Well, they formed the company in Baltimore. Okay. 127th Ordinance. But we were from several different companies out in uh, Wyoming. Wyoming. Okay. So what happened in Baltimore then? <clears throat> Nothing. The, to keep you busy, you had uh, uh, basic, more basic training. I knew more about basic training than the people giving it to me. Because every time they kept you busy, they didn't let you lay around. Oh, by the way, when I was in there, they needed, uh, that was a proving ground then. I got a chance of driving test trucks. Uh, well, all test vehicles are tested there. And I'd like to stay there, but they moved the outfit to uh, Annapolis. So we had to go back. We were just loaned them temporary. It was a good job. We'd drive out on the highway for oh. two weeks. We'd drive uh, back on the, what they call Burma Road for another week or two. And then we had to drive in the sand pits. Now the sand pits, you can only go about 10 or 15 miles an hour and to get a thousand or so miles. It took quite a while. Could you tell us about the trucks? What type? All kinds. There were even Studebaker trucks. 
Studebaker trucks, uh, GMC, Chevrolet. Would these be light duty or would they be like deuce and a half? Or? Uh, two and a half. Two and a half ton. Yeah. Okay. Now, they had uh, amphibious things there too. I didn't get a ch chance to drive them. Like uh, some that six wheel things would go on the road and go in the water also. Yeah. And they had little ones that must have been built on a Jeep chassis that would do the same thing. Like they could take it out in the Chesapeake Bay and try them out, but I never got to that. Who manufactured those amphibious vehicles? Do you recall? I don't know. I think some of them were on uh, GMC uh, chassis. I see. And the little ones might have been on Jeep. Well, this was the time that Jeep came to the forefront, wasn't yeah. it? <clears throat> that was developed by Henry Kaiser. Is that yeah. It? Yeah. Developed it. So it's not. Okay, so how long were you in Fort Holliver? Oh, uh, the first time about eight or ten weeks. I can't remember exactly. And then they sent us to Camp Filmer in New Jersey. And we thought sure we were going over there. But we didn't do anything. Just to keep us busy, more basic training. I had basic training in all of them. And then when I joined the fair troops, I had to take it over again. So you're over New Jersey, then, then what happened? You're there for New Jersey. We went to, uh, I think, uh, Camp uh, Ferry. Camp Ferry Proving Ground. And I don't know, we've been taking more basic there. There we lived in huts. What? Four men to a hut. What was the hut like? What, what it was a tar it? paper building. A little tar paper building, maybe about 12 by 12. Did you have to construct them or were they no, already there? No, they were already there. They had a nice main bearing there with a uh, building where the PX was. It was as nice as Hollowbird's. But the rest of it was just little tiny huts. You were up there again as an ordinance group? Uh, yeah. Evaluating vehicles or? No, just putting in our time. Just waiting. Then we had to go over to uh, Erie Proving Grounds. More basic training there. We had to dig a foxhole, crawl in it, and let tanks run over you. <laughs> Big deal. <laughs> yeah, I imagine the first one passing over top of you was quite an experience. You would, you would get down that hole. That's one way to make sure it was dug deep enough, wasn't it? Yeah. For how long did that go on? Oh, that was only one summer. That was nice because we could walk down to the beach at night and go swimming, not even get off the post. And it was also near uh, Cedar Point. I had my car there and I was living it up there. I'd have been a 30-year man if I could have stayed there. <laughs> Then from there, went to Oliver Ordnance Depot, more tire paper buildings. Um, the toilets were in a separate building. And uh, we had a full guard around empty bunkers. The bunkers was built to store ammo. There was no ammo in any of them. They had electric lights in them. And then from there, we went back to Camp Kilmer again until they got tents put up at uh, oh, I forget the name of the place where we did nothing but manual labor knocking the fuses out of uh, spent uh, cartridges all different size from oh, 37 millimeter up to one five five. Once in a while, there'd be a little powder left in them, and you get a loud boom out of them. I bet you would. So, how'd you go from Baltimore back to New Jersey? 
they transfer this group by train or by truck or? Well, we travel by train all the time. Train. It was from uh, Mississippi. We went to. Uh, where'd you Where'd you go from your last stint there in New Jersey? Where'd you go? New next Jersey, to? Camp Ferry, then uh, uh, Mississippi. You went to Mississippi. Mississippi. We went to Fort Lewis, Washington. What did you do in Mississippi? Same thing. Same thing. Wait. Just wait. All this time, you guys. All the time, I, we were just pushed around. For about two years. But th during this length of time, you're under, you think you're under orders possibly to. Yes. You're waiting to ship out right. all this time. Right. right. What about mail from home then? Uh, I guess this stuff was always a couple, it, about a month or so behind you, wasn't it? Yes. If we had an APO number, it'd be probably a month behind us. But uh, it would only take a couple of days for the letter, my letters to get home. But we went to an ordnance depot out in Washington, and uh, we would work in the ordnance depot. They were shipping stuff out to different outfits. And we also take more basic training. You never had a chance through the week to sit around and do anything or do nothing. What were your accommodations like in uh, Louisiana? Tire paper buildings. Uh, the, the plumbing was in a separate building, and from there, uh, Mississippi uh, went to Fort Lewis, Washington. Those were good barracks there. But when you're in barracks, you're mostly sleeping on uh, army cots yeah. or bunks. But yeah. in these tar paper shacks, are you sleeping on the floor? Or no, what? no. You had, uh, no. Well, always had. Cots in the United States. Always had cots. Yeah. Cots are army beds. And then from there I went to uh, volunteered for the fire troops and went, was sent to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Let me ask you this. Why why did you decide to go airborne? Well, it was awful boring doing what we had to do was uh Basic training in every place we went, you didn't get a chance. The only time if you could get a pass and get off the base, get away from it. Otherwise, you had to, they didn't let you sit around through the days at all. It was always basic training, basic training everywhere. How long did uh, the airborne training take? Well, we had to take basic training again. That was about four weeks and then I had to go to jump school. That was about four more, I think. I think that's what it was. They had uh, jumping off of platforms about five feet high, teaching you how to land. Then they went to uh, about 50 foot and you had to jump and you were on a cable, went down. You wouldn't hurt yourself when you got down. Then from there we went to 200 foot towers, free fall. What would catch you then? Nothing, you'd parachute. Parachute from 200 feet? Yeah, it was already opened up. Oh, when, okay. So. When they pulled you up, you put your harness on, the chute was open. In each corner of the chute was pulled straight up. There was arms out on this. And it would get you up there and they could trip it and you would go down there. There's no chance. <laughs> Unless the wind was wrong, and then they would make sure there was four arms on it, and uh, if the wind was blowing from right to left, they wouldn't put you on the right one. They'd put you on the left one. What sort of new technology did you experience or see in jump school when you're going through this uh, training? Is there any like new type weapons or? No. The nylon or the ropes or anything that they no. were using? Was any of this new that you hadn't seen before? No. Okay. Then from the jump school, got a furlough. And after the furlough, we came back and made another jump. Made six jumps down there, five to qualify. One was a night jump. And uh, 
Then went home on furlough, came back and made one more jump. They sent us to uh, California, Camp Roberts. From Camp Roberts, it was 30 days on the boat to get to uh, Leyte, by the way, in New Guinea. For you? They wouldn't let us off the boat in New Guinea. We stopped at two different ports in New Guinea, but never could get off the ship. If we could go back to this jump school, uh, were they selective, the people that they took in there, yeah. or they just took all volunteers? Or Well, they took volunteers, but you got to pass the physical. Yeah, pass the physical. Yeah. What about your first jump? What was that? Where was that, and from uh, what altitude and what type of aircraft were you uh, The first one, I think, was about 1,200 feet. It wasn't very high. And then each time they would come down 200. Now, I think that's the way it was. It's, I can't remember. We would go up at Fort Benning. It was a short ride across the river into Alabama and drop in Alabama. What type of aircraft were you jumping C-47. Oh, that's... I thought maybe it'd be the old DC threes. No, C forty seven. They have to have about twenty four to a uh, two sticks each side. They call a stick. They uh, had twelve on each side, and then you get up, stand up, walk up, stand in the door, and then I don't know who gave the orders to jump, and uh, you had to, so you didn't get scattered. They wanted you as close together as possible. So there would be a, a jump sergeant there. You know, he'd slap you on the leg to, you time. know, get going. Some say they pushed you out. I don't remember anybody being pushed out. But they kept coming down, maybe a 1,000 feet, 800. And it was, the last jump was awful uh, low. And then the last... One of the jumps was an eight jump. But I just missed Corregidor. We were on our way over when our outfit went into Corregidor, 503rd. But we went to, it took us 30 days to get over there. What was the name of the ship you were on? You recall? Yeah. I, One was the St. Clair, that, that might have been the one coming home. I can't think of the one going over. Where did you uh, disembark from there in California? Camp Roberts. Is that in California? Yeah. I forget what town it's near. We didn't get a chance to get off the base because we were only there probably overnight. So you shipped out from uh, Fort Benning straight to uh, California? Yeah. Put you on the boat right away. Yeah. How long do you do you recall how long it took you to get from uh, Georgia to California by train? Oh, I would say about at least two days. Two days, two nights. <clears throat> you you uh, if we could back up, you said that you uh, you were given a furlough after uh, your first after my fifth after jump. your fifth jump. Yeah. Where did you go then? Did you go home or? I went home, yeah. Oh, I had my furlough, so I had my time all used up. I even had maybe five, six day furloughs at, when I was in Baltimore. But I got a two week one after Georgia. Then uh, we landed in Leyte. There was a, I don't know what they called it. We had uh, could get a shower on the boats. We wasn't allowed to use fresh water. That was officers. We had to use that salt water, and that was hell. So after we got to Leyte, we got a fresh shower. And uh, this is kind of interesting. They would dig a well, and over here they'd build a rack. And all over the all over the well, they'd build a rack. The person would stand on top of the bucket dip down in the water, put it up and put it in a barrel. And there was a pipe running over to where the shower was so the water wouldn't run back in the well again. And that's how you got your shower. 
Uh, you pull water for me, I'll pull water for you. Hmm. How long uh, were you on board ship with saltwater showers? 30 days. 30 days. Wow. Didn't even, and our water was warm water. I sneaked into the, got some fr uh, fresh water. One of the officers caught me there and run me out. They got cold water, cooler. We didn't have a cooler. And after... Did you, excuse me, did you have to pull any duty or do anything on board ship besides clean your weapons or whatever? <clears throat> no, I can't say that I did. What type of weapons were you issued then when you left California? What were you issued? When we got overseas, we were issued M1 Durand. See, they had them carvings supposed to have been for the uh, paratroops, but they wasn't uh, much of a weapon. A little shell like that. Right, right. So they gave us an M1 Duran. Well, you weren't issued that until you got to no. the Pacific. Right. What did, what did you leave California with? The carbines or nothing? Nothing. Oh, okay. We left with the gas mask. Most of the people threw them overboard after dark. <laughs> I kept mine till I got overseas before I ditched it. There's more uh, gas mask in the ocean out there. And then after a couple of days there, they sent us, put us on an LSI and we, went, we were replacements from the 503rd, which was on Negros at the time. Negros Island. Uh, they have all volcanic peaks and you could go in maybe four, five, six miles. Then you, st you know, start going up pretty steep. And they took us by truck that far. They left us at a uh, battalion headquarters. See, a regimental combat team uh, was uh, artillery, infantry, and you had your medics, and you had everything like that, complete outfit. Well, the artillery was a 50 caliber machine gun and a 105 howitzer. We never saw that. What about your trip across the Pacific? You're on board this ship. We haven't recalled the name yet. But you had to be in a convoy. No. Well, you were not in a convoy. No convoy from here to New Guinea. Real. No convoy. And after we got to New Guinea and started, we still didn't know where we were going. We formed a, or they formed a convoy there, and I never saw so many ships in my life. I don't know where they came from. We went to two ports in New Guinea. Couldn't get off. Now, when the convoy traveled, you would be in here, the troop ships would be surrounded with others, you know. Tankers, you could tell them. They were about three feet out of water. And uh, battleships and the big ships, you know, were off the side. Well, they traveled so long in this direction, then they would switch and go like this. Well, that battleship or whatever it was, a cruiser or whatever that was to your right, is now behind you. And then maybe the next time you'd switch back and maybe you'd, you'd zigzag from New Guinea to uh, the Philippines. So you never put in a pearl on the way? Just bypass? No, that's right, because pearl's way north of that, isn't it? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> I remember crossing the, the international date line and crossing the equator. I got, I don't know where they're at. Uh, Did you get your certificate? Yeah, I got them. I was wondering if they did that in wartime, if everybody, you know, if things were uh, decent, if everybody got dumped there at the equator like they say they do. I don't know if that actually happened or not. I don't know. I remember there was a fat cook on the ship. He had a, a greased his belly. I don't know what one, bacon grease or axle grease. He had to kiss his belly. <laughs> 
It's supposed to be Neptune, huh? Yeah. Okay, so you finally reached New Guinea. From New Guinea to Leyte. Leyte. How far a trip was that? Oh, that probably was five days. I don't know exactly. Sure, sure. But I'd say five days. And we was only in Leyte a couple of days, and they loaded us on the LST and sent us to Negros. And I was always clean shaven. I couldn't stand whiskers. Still can't. And we were staying at uh, uh, Regimental Battalion Headquarters. And uh, there was uh, bombing up ahead. The, the, the outfit was farther advanced than us. We were still at Battalion Headquarters. And this Navy plane has a bomb under each wing with hooks on it. And when they went forward to bomb and they circled again, this one bomb was still hanging there, hanging by one hook. Well, it got almost over battalion headquarters and that damn thing came loose. Whoa. But I was in a crater shaven because if they would bomb one day, the next day you would have clear water down in the bottom. So I went. I was down there shaving, and that thing went off. And then the following day, it got moved up with their outfit. But after we got moved with their outfit, we got K rations, ten and one rations. What's a ten and one ration? Ten and one was enough for a squad. There would be a can of bacon about this big, about this big around, like the big tomato juice can. Right. And you had a, it was partially cooked, but you had to finish cooking it, I guess. Anyway, we cooked it. And we never had a chance to clean our mess kits. That's when I got dysentery. And I had dysentery so rotten. And uh, that's when they planted the uh, booby traps with a telephone wire fastened to the pin. And I went out with my little shovel to do what I was supposed to do. And I tripped that. Well, I hit the ground then. And that was really the most, that and that bomb was the most exciting. But I know one thing, when you have dysentery, and you have to go to the John always face the wind. <laughs> oh, that's tough. So what unit were you assigned to when you were there in Leyte? Uh, uh, 503rd, 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 Regimental Combat Team. Then when the war was winding down, the old timers in the 503rd got to come home and they sent us, I think it was 11th Division. They were in Japan at the time. And we went there. And I was there until I was uh, ready to come home. Were you exposed to any combat? Yeah. Where, where was your first encounter with the... Uh, the only encounter was on Negros Island. What, what was, can you share that was, what that was like? You, you didn't know. I mean, it, you'd never seen anybody. You would hear shots, but you'd never seen anyone. The, the jungle was thick when you got up on the side of the... See, if you start in here at sea level, and it gradually goes up, and then it, as you get up there, it's no good for farming or for the people to live, it's nothing but jungle. And you didn't see the enemy. He probably saw you first. How long was your first encounter, uh, first couple of days or so? How long were you under fire? Oh, we was at the front there, probably a couple of weeks. Then they sent us back, oh, maybe a few miles and we got to sleep in 
tents before we had uh, slit trenches. And three people would sleep together. And uh, uh, you had a watch between you. And each person was supposed to stay awake for an hour. And then you would wake the next guy up and pass him the watch. But some of the guys would cheat, would change the change time on the clock. Yeah. I can't imagine that. <laughs> I can't imagine that. You don't think they'd do it, huh? <laughs> I don't think they would do that. <laughs> Honest little devils. Sure. But you, uh, learn, uh, you learn a hell of a lot. Don't volunteer for anything. That's right. What about your weather conditions? I mean, besides sleeping outside and being miserable, what about the mosquitoes and that sort? Well, you know, I can't remember the mosquitoes. I remember picking leeches off my the tongue of my shoes. I don't know where they came from. What about your uh, the weather? I mean... Were you there during the uh, rainy seasons, or was it? Well, it rained, but uh, not all the time. You had your ponchos, and that was it. Sometimes you had to sleep under your ponchos. And you're sleeping under the ponchos, and you're in you're in water beside. Would you uh, dig a your slit uh, slit trench for three? Put your ponchos up. You put a little trench around it to try to drain the water away. Did you ever have to jump into combat? No. So you never? No. Uh, the 503rd did, they jumped, they made two jumps, one at Numa 4 and the other one at Corregidor. They were the ones that retook Corregidor. But I was on the way over when they took Corregidor. So you were just catching up? Heading that way towards them, right? Yeah. What was uh, your last encounter with the Japanese? Where where was it? Do you recall? The combat. Right. In uh, Negro Island. Oh, that was that was. Yeah. It. Okay. You say that was for a couple of weeks. At a time. You, you, then you, you would come back for maybe a few days. Then you'd go back again. Okay, they would cycle you in and out. Yeah. For what, over what length of time? A couple months? Or oh, what? yeah. A good couple months. Where would you go off cycle when you weren't on the front lines there? You didn't go nowhere. You were just back on the beach yeah. or somewhere? You didn't the... even get to the beach. Oh, okay. Okay. Just fall back in a back yeah. area somewhere. You ever have any... Experiences with those 90-day wonders that they created during the war? Yeah. Uh, Good or bad? In Japan, bad for me. Yeah. Uh, you might explain what a 90-day wonder is. A 90-day wonder is somebody that went to OCS for 90 days and went over as an officer. They never had no training in the, out there or not. They just plain. And they thought they knew it all. What about the clothing issue? You're out there uh, for an extended period of time in and off the front lines. Uh, what about you having trouble getting decent clothes when you went to the rear? We would get new clothes, but not that often. What about mail and packages from home now that you're out there in the Pacific? I got my camera from home when the war was over. That burned in a fire in Japan. And I never got to use it much. Curious, can you tell us something about the email? Oh. Or not email, V-mail. V-mail, yeah. V-mail. Ah. Uh, well, V-mail was uh, put on uh, tape and sent home. Well, is that right? Yeah. I never knew how that was done. Yeah, the email was put on tape and sent home, and I don't know how they sorted it out and mailed it on. But it, it didn't, didn't cost us anything for postage. Because it seems like whenever it was received, it'd be like on just something a little bit bigger than a postcard. Yeah. Or like four by five. Yeah. 
and it was like a photograph. The real, uh, I believe it was glossy, yeah. and the writing was very, very small. It was, yeah. What about when you were in that combat area? What about materiel as far as firearms and ammo and su support? Do you experience any, uh, have any bad experiences with that? Yeah. Uh, our, uh, I was an uh, 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 ammo bearer when I first went over, and the guy that was a machine gunner was a sergeant. And of course, I hated it. Like, you get out of everything you can. And the enamel got wet, and those canvas belts shrunk up. And he had to uh, use the machine gun, and the damn thing would keep ja uh, jamming. You had to pull it back, you know, and let a couple more rounds go and jam again. And uh, he chewed the hell out of us. It could have meant life or death. Absolutely. So that's one of the re one of the reasons you often heard about machine guns jamming is because the belt would get wet and it would dry out and yeah. contract and uh, yeah. shrink around the round. And when you went over, well, you was I was uh, okay. Some went and uh, carried mortars, sixty millimeter. I was assigned a machine gun. You had to carry two boxes of ammo plus your rifle in your pack. And uh, uh, oh, when you first went in, you were at the tail end of the machine gun uh, crew carrying ammo. And there'd be about three or four ammo bears. Well, as time went on, if somebody got hurt, I you would get moved up, and I got moved up to. Uh, uh, assistant machine gunner. Assistant machine gunner carried the machine gun and the gunner carried the tripod. So I advanced. But when I went overseas, I had a sergeant's uh, rating. But when I went over there, got to battalion headquarters, I lost it and went right back down to Buck Par Private. But after we got to Japan, they tried to get the guys to sign up again, and I got my rating back. But I wasn't about to sign up. That's a good thing because the Korean War started right after that. What was the the pay about that time? Do you recall what you were? Yeah, sergeant. When a buck private was fifty dollars, I think. I'm not sure. I think it was fifty. Jump pay was fifty. Is that no? Sergeant was seventy eight dollars, and uh, corporal was I think sixty six. Private was less than that. I forget. Are you getting, is that including the combat pay? No, the combat pay was I think nine dollars more. And then your jump pay was fifty dollars more. So. Well, did, you had to be assigned to a jump unit to draw the... Yeah. So you weren't drawing, you weren't getting the extra $50 a month. At yeah. Time. Oh, you were? Yeah. Okay. The 503rd was a regimental combat team. Fair troops. Well, that's pretty good money, that $50. What, oh, that's yeah. That's a lot of money. That was good. Wow. What about the frequency of hot meals uh, there in... Uh, your combat area were they frequent, or imagine they were very, very infrequent if they ever yeah. happened. The only time you would get them was when uh, you would get moved back, oh maybe a few miles. You would get a cooked meal. Otherwise, it was nothing but K rations and uh, C rations. What was the difference? K rations was like a cracker jack box, and you would get a little can of. Scrambled eggs, you would get uh, uh, tropical chocolate bar, some cookies that you could hardly eat, and something to make a drink out of. You couldn't get cold water, only out of a stream. That was the coolest. 
and then the ten and one was a bigger one. Uh, that was a, this is the C ration then. C C ration. So C ration what an individual serving no. so it was for a group. Yeah. I see. I see. What about what about snipers? Did you experience No. Or any of the nasty caves or they were on Guadalcanal and other areas? Did you have No. They uh I'll tell you what it was. They had a uh Japanese had an air base there. We drove by it and seen it. And I never seen so many planes in my life, but they couldn't get off the ground. They were out of uh, fuel. fuel. But uh, they stripped all their guns off of them, and they packed them up in the hills. So they had some uh, pretty good weapons up in there. Hmm. Did you lose any friends there? Yes. In that area? Yes. Guy I went through jump school with one. You Married and three kids. What was his name? I can't remember it right now. Did you ever bump into uh, any uh, old school chums or anybody from no. home during your military service? No. Only uh, I went to see one. He was A.P. Hill Military Reservation in Virginia. And I was in Baltimore, and I got a pass to go and see him. So he couldn't get a pass, so he took off anyway. We were out hitchhiking towards Washington. His company commander came along and gave us a ride into Washington. Wow, very good. And he never asked about any questions. <laughs> Whether he had a pass or not. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he knew better. That, uh, that, that just more could create more work for him. <laughs> that uh, AP Hill was nothing but, oh, that was woods and brush. And I don't know how I, when I think about it now, I don't know how I ever found him. <clears throat> that was the sole uh, combat ex Experience you had there? Yeah. Okay. On Negro Island. On Negro Island, okay. See any of those famous generals or anybody of any notoriety? Yeah, I've seen uh, General Stowe while I've seen him. Uh, he came through to uh, survey everything out. They had us stand. Okay. Uh, they would, the roads would follow the top of the hill. And they would brought him in by jeep, and they had a station along the road, about every oh hundred feet, and that made him mad. He says, "Get him out of there!" So they came back with a jeep before the general came back. Get down, get out of sight. We had to jump down over the edge, you know, and stay out of sight. But that's the only time I've seen a a general. How many stars is he? I think he was four, three oh, or was four. It? Wow, yeah. He's right under MacArthur then, the four yeah. star. Yeah, wow. oh, Vinegar Bend. That was his name, Vinegar Bend? Yeah. What was your first ho uh, uh, holiday in a combat area? Were you in there like over Christmas or Easter or any time like that? I was in Japan Christmas and New Year's. This would be a uh, 44? 45. 45. We got turkey. We got good food there. Then it was soon after that I got to come home. Packages from home. Did you receive anything while you were out I there? I get stuff I can't remember what. I remember getting packages. Of course, cigarettes back then were just about furnished, weren't they, to everybody? Yeah. K, uh, K rations, <laughs> breakfast, they gave you four. And uh, uh, lunch, they get, uh, you got four more in there. We're, we're talking about cigarettes? S pa uh, packs of four. Packs of four packs of four. 
and at night, your evening, you got four packs of four. So you got 12 a day. What would you do to light them? Oh, they would have lighters. Lighter, everybody had a lighter of some kind. They'd trade or get them. I don't know where they got them. But I didn't smoke, so I would uh, save them and get other stuff, trade them off to guys. Because in the jungle, uh, matches aren't going to do the trick. No. So Mark, they had uh, what? Uh, cigarette lighters, not yeah. the butane. They had a, another lighter there that you didn't need. It didn't light up. You just put that up to your cigarette and start puffing, and your cigarette would light. I never seen them anymore. I'll be there. What about U.S. shows? Were you ever in a position to uh, attend a U.S. show? The only U yeah. I saw in New York when I was at Camp Kilmer, saw one at Madison Square Gardens. There was four uh, big time bands there, orchestras. I remember the Andrew Sisters was there. I can't remember the name of the orchestras, but they were all four. Oh, I thought that was something great to see all of them. Absolutely. And you could walk down New York and see on the marquee what orchestra was playing, playing here or what was there. Phil Spitonley and the All Girl Orchestra. I saw that a couple of times. Got up in the bowl headed row. <laughs> Or have any experiences with the Red Cross? Yeah. I remember them coming up pretty close to the front. They would have a tank of water on a two-wheel trailer. And you might have seen them. Sure. And they would make uh, some kind of a drink. And they got ice. I don't know where they got the ice. Had to get it back in town somewhere. It was the nearest town we were to. On Negros, the first one was Bacolded, or Backlog, I don't know how you pronounce it. I think it was Bacolded. But they'd actually come up on the front lines yeah. with... Well, yeah, very close to the front. Yeah. And they would, uh, back farther, they brought in... Uh, Excuse candy. me, were, were these medics, or was this the, the, the Red, Red Cross? Cross? Red the Cross. Red Cross. And then... Uh, uh, in like the town of Bacola, they would have places there. They would give you razors, candy bars. Yeah, I can't say anything against the Red Cross over there. And then when we got to Japan, there were some Red Cross ladies came over and stayed, well, in the officers' quarters. I think there was about four of them. They were dressed in OD. I don't know what they did. When we got to Japan, and I got to drive in a Jeep over there, taking people around, taking uh, guards around. And uh, I got sent out to another little town Boy, that was something they'd load you on the train to take you to the town. You didn't know where the hell you were going. They, the, instead of the cars loading from the end, they'd let the side down, and you would drive on from the side. Where was this in Japan? Uh, the town of Morioka. It was on the main island, the northern part. And while we were there, our barracks burned down. It was... a uh, Wooden barracks, something like our barracks uh, and basic training, but it, that was uh, an agriculture college there. We moved in. When were you there? I was there. I spent Thanksgiving there of uh, 45 and Christmas. Uh, and, you were there as part of the occupational force then? Yeah. <clears throat> But I left soon after. I left in February, early February, because I got home the 
and I got discharged at 12. And then after we came back, they sent us to, well, I forget the name of it. We're discharged from Illinois. I wanted to ask you about religious experience there, Uncle Bud, in regards to uh, priests or ministers and mass um, in the combat area. Yeah. Was that afforded? Uh, yeah. Went to mass and what have you? Well, uh, no. Area? Going over on the boat, we didn't have a priest. But one of the, uh, he was a second lieutenant. He would lead everybody in saying the rosary. And that was our religion going over. Sure. Absolutely. But there was, uh, yeah, they afforded them. Maybe not that many. Now, I don't remember up in the front, but I know they had them there. They had what? Priests and preachers. Oh, okay. Remember where you were when the war ended in Europe? That was May 7th of yeah. 1945? Yeah. I was on Negro Island. They forgot to tell the Japs over there that the war ended. But that was in Europe. It wasn't the Japanese. See, they wouldn't give up. No, right. They had to drop radios into them. Then they finally brought them out. And then, you know, there was people there that not on there, but I read about it, on Guam, that never gave up until a couple of years after the war was over. That's right. I, Came I, out and there was nothing but skin and bone and rags. What about the surrender of Japan in 45? Where were you then in September? <laughs> uh, same you, island. Still there. Yeah. See, nobody told them back there. They had no way of communicating. The only thing they were doing was fighting to stay alive. It wasn't like Iwo Jima and places like that. Do you ever see any signs of Kilroy there in the Pacific? Do you know, I can't say when or where, but they used to have them in all the toilets all over. Everybody scribbled that Kilroy was yeah, there? Yeah. But I don't remember where or when. Well, how'd you get back to the States? You you left Japan then? You were there I left for... Japan and came back Orchard in Illinois. It was uh, discharged from there. But you came back by surface, you came back by yeah. ship. Everything was by uh, ship. That'd be th at least 30 days, I guess, from over there. No, it wasn't. It was only about 12. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it was no time at all. The only time we had a plane ride, we took a load of prisoners from Negros to Luzon or some other place. And uh, it was an LST or LSI. Anyway, the deck was all open. They had to sleep there. And we got a good Navy meal on them. And we came back to our outfit. They flew us back with C-46. That was the only ride I had in the plane over there. Did you take many prisoners? Well, the war was over and they started giving up. No, the prisoners was far and few. Do you recall the name of the ship that you uh, came back to the mainland? Back to the yeah, United States? Yeah, huh? came to me now. Went over on the Cape Clare, came back on the General Altman. A-L-T-M-A-N? Yeah. I think they were all Kaiser Bill ships. Well, what was it like being discharged? You uh, you came in you you came into California. Where did you embark in California? I would say it was 
San Pedro, but I don't know where the hell San Pedro is. I remember the name San Pedro, but I don't know if that was the name of the base or the town or what. And they put you on board a, a, a train and shipped you into Illinois? Yeah. That was when I got back. The first thing I got was I had a chance to get ice cream and uh, I got fried eggs and something bought it because everything we had was canned eggs. And... Sure. Funny, I didn't get sick again. Where did you leave your, your weapons and your M1 Grand that you were issued? Japan. You left that in Japan. Everybody left them there. Now, I got a Japanese rifle and I'm Agros. And I was going to keep it. And I kept it so long, I got tired of carrying it. So I just smashed it up, left it there. But after we got back to Japan, they all had to turn their weapons in and they had piles of them. And I picked out a carbine, uh, 31 caliber or 30 caliber, 31 I think. And I picked out a sword. Now the sword, the handle don't look good. I don't have it. Mike's got it. And he's got the gun too. Oh, you did bring a carbine back. I sent it back. And I uh, went to the town and got him to make a box, and I saved the box that's out in the barn. And I think it cost me, oh Lord, nine yen or something like that. It was very cheap, probably a quarter to make the box. And they nailed it together, put everything on there. All I had to do was put the, the address on and send it home. Well, we learned. Huh. Yeah, I got a sword. And Mike's got it. I like to see that sometimes. Well, now the handle is terrible on it, and it's pitted. I put grease on it to try to preserve it, and I put some shoe strings. I tried making a handle for it, but it, it wasn't like the one the, the officers had, the uh, Japanese officers. How long is it? Oh. Oh my, really? Huh. As the sheath on the sheath is partly rusted. So you left California. They put you on a train and shipped you to Illinois. Camp Sheridan. Camp Sheridan. Is that around Chicago? Yeah. What? How long did it take you to clear that area? Oh, it wasn't long. Maybe a day, and we were out of there. They got us out in a hurry. What about getting home? What'd you do? So everybody got paid then? That should have been memorable. No. You didn't get paid there? I don't remember. But we had pay coming. They sent us a hundred dollars a month for three months after we got out. They provided transportation home then? Well well they give us yeah, they gave us a ticket home. But uh that was the last I seen a lot of the guys. We went to the bus station there. And they all went their different ways. Well, what was your? You uh, took a train. To, you were there in Chicago. Then, how did you uh, get home? I think it took the train to Detroit, and then took the bus from Detroit home. The Greyhound bus, or? Local local bus or what? I can't remember. What was your reception like at home? They know you were coming? Or did you surprise them? I think I surprised them. Because you don't write when you're on the boat coming home because you beat the letter home. I probably wrote to them from Japan. I'm sure I did. But they... Uh, Trying to make it rosy for you to re-enlist. And that's when we got uh, 90 Day Wonders. Uh, they came in. I was uh, driving Jeep somewhere. And everybody was supposed to lay their stuff out on their cot, you know, for inspection. Well, the hell with the war was over. I wasn't going to do it. And when I came back that night, all my duffel bag was dumped out. 
Filipino mud and everything in it, dumped out on the bed, and I was quarantined until I had everything cleaned up. <laughs> oh, it was fun. That's when the 90 Day Wonders was coming in. When you were there in Japan, how close were you to the uh, Ground Zero sites? There at Nagasaki and Tokyo. 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 I went to see a football game there. The 11th Division played somebody. Football game there. I think it was on a New Year's. It may have been Christmas. No, I, I'd say New Year's. We'll say New Year's. Eleventh Division and somebody else. Well, what was your reception like when you got home? Who was there to meet you? My two brothers. That's all I had left in the family. Were they either one of your brothers in the service? No. They were much older than me. See, Lester was 14 and a half years older. The other one was, well, 13 and a half. That's about it as far as I can think of. Did you ever had any contact with any of your fellows yeah. from the service? Yeah. I still contact them. They call once a year, or else I call. One's in Iowa, and the other's in uh, near St. Louis, Sandoval, Illinois. That kid, he called me a couple weeks ago. I uh, went through jump school with him. Oh, really? But we got separated. <laughs> You don't pay to be honest, Jerry. Be crooked, lie, do everything. <laughs> uh, we went through jump school together, and that was fine. All right, when we were in uh, Washington, we got acquainted with some people out there, the civilians that worked in the depot, and we knew their address and where they lived. So uh, when we got through jump school, they asked us where our home was, where we were going, you know, for Perlo. He said, uh, Olympia, Washington. Okay. We give him a pass or you get a couple extra days. I told him the truth. Well, he got two more days than I did. So when we came back, just as they came back, they put him in a group and they sent him there. They sent me to uh, California. They sent him to the Europe. And he was got back a couple days later than me. And the war ended there. And he got out of the service before I did. He went in much later than I did. He was just a young kid, about 20 years old. And he got out, oh, I'd say a couple of months before I did. So it don't pay to be honest. So he went to the European theater yeah. and you went to the Pacific. Yeah, just because he told a lie, said his home was in Washington. So he got some extra days. Yeah. Where was he really from? Sandoval, Illinois, <laughs> near St. Louis. St. Louis. <laughs> Somebody talked to him, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> I was what, dumb. What about the other fellow? The other fellow I went to see, uh, uh, he lives in Iowa. Uh, I can't think of the name. Well, anyway, I went out to see him a few years ago. What are their names? Richard Pike and uh, the other one we call him Junior. Wilbur. Wilbur something. I'll think of it. But they all called him Junior. He was such a young kid at the time. But we was in the ordinance together from uh, Mississippi to Washington to the fair troops. So I knew him quite well. 
oh yeah, he used to drive truck into Cincinnati. And every time he came in, uh, I would get to see him, you know, he would come out. In fact, is he would sleep out at our place. His, uh, he drove for Hussman and Roper from St. Louis to Cincinnati. I would see him almost every week then. Foles, F-O-L-T-C, Wilbur Foles. Very good. So after the war, you joined uh, VFW. How long have you been in VFW? No, I didn't join it until I was down at Merrill's. I was... Back in the 70s? Yeah. Bill Doyle talked me into it. I joined the VFW. And then I came out here and joined the American Legion. Still active in the VFW? I still pay dues. Do so? I don't know. Here they... Uh, I went when... Uh, I was sworn into the American Legion, and I've never been back since. You well, you know where it's at. Sure. sure. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? I can't think of anything. That's. Uh... I can't think of a thing. <laughs> But what I'll never forget is that bomb going off not very far. And I was it kicked the dirt up and showered me. And I was down in the crater getting water to shave. And that's uh, I never will forget that. And that was the first day I was at battalion headquarters. And then uh, dysentery. They lose any, they lose any people with that? No. Just dropped in the area, it didn't take yeah. anybody out. But it made a hole, oh, 15 feet in diameter, and it was cone shaped. Down in the bottom, the water had settled, it had been dropped maybe the day before or so. But when you get over there, the guys, you could tell the old timers. They were woolly, you know, they didn't have the facilities to shave, so they let their beards grow. And there was nothing said about it. What about some of the equipment <clears throat> when, when you were over there, when you were in the service, the, the new technologies? Uh, just about the time radar was developed, uh, what about the weapons? Uh, I guess that's when the uh, M1 came into vogue. That came in the beginning of, I think, World War II. Right. Because all our basic training in this country, we had the old uh, Springfield. Springfield. And then when we got out overseas, we had the M1. I go back. Um, I noticed in a book that the that the draft started in October of uh, forty, and they were drafting uh, twenty one to thirty six year olds. I got a deferment before December seventh. I don't know when. Sometime during forty one, I got a six month deferment. You'd have to apply for that every whenever the deferment expired. Yeah. Reapply for it. Yeah, but. <clears throat> By the time it was up, the war was on and there was no, right. you had to go. Right. Right. Well, Uncle Bud, do you have anything else you'd like to No, I share? can't think of anything. Well, appreciate very much sharing this with us. Is the camera off? Oh, it's, no, it's not off. She's still running. Still running. But I never will forget as long as I live. Is that dysentery? How'd you ever get over it? They give you sulfur pills. 
Keep taking sulfa pills. Finally get over it. The mess kits, when you try to cook that bacon that was in the tin and one, the bottom of the uh, mess kit was black from over a fire. And to get a fire going, okay, the tin and ones, well, the K rations, that was uh, uh, paper. Good. You gotta push the button.